Hello and welcome back. For this segment of our presentation, I'm joined today by my dear friends and fellow Uplift admins, Dan and Roseanne. How are you guys today? Doing good. Doing great. Good. All right, so to kick off our presentation uh, for today, uh, I'd like us to examine this word on the screen that you see, crisis. What are some of the thoughts that come to mind when you, the listener, are, hear this word? You might have all kinds of things uh, that reminds you of a uh, troubling childhood, um, uh, recent job loss, uh, family problems, uh, health issues, all kinds of things come to mind. Uh, so we'll look at, look at this and see what kind of things uh, are behind this word and go along with this word. So in Uplift, we frequently talk about faith crisis. Uh, it even seems to be a buzzword among some of our youth, as though it's a rite of passage or a sign of maturity. What do we mean when we use this term? Uh, specifically in Uplift, what do we mean? Ask differently, what's under the hood of a faith crisis? Well, when our faith begins to suffer, there are other things that can begin to feel chaotic. Here's a small sampling. Our minds begin to race. Our hearts start to pound and ache. Our trust is damaged and fades. Hope is displaced by despair. Love is strained and lost. Future becomes uncertain. Health suffers. Our friendships go dark and we feel alone. Our families fall apart. Our very lives are in chaos. And we start to suffer by way of identity. At the very root of the crisis, our eternal identity is challenged. So as someone who is born into the church, for example, you are told certain things about who you are, where you come from. And when your faith crisis hits, this is the biggest, most painful thing for a lot of us, is our, who are we at, at that point? So this is an introduction, and we're going to talk here for a minute uh, or two and ask for Dan and Roseanne to, to weigh in. But in the middle here, we have this identity crisis that splits us. Before our doubt, and we're talking about heavy doubt, as you know, small doubts, a few questions, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a faith crisis that, that really pushes you toward leaving the church um, or stopping, stopping your belief in God. And so we're going to look at here at some of these things. So before doubt, what do we mean? Uh, could you read this for us, uh, Roseanne? Would that be okay? Sure. Before doubt, I feel like I belong and that I'm fully accepted. I'm confident in my divine identity and destination. I effortlessly speak and act like everyone else. I believe that I'm a part of something bigger. I feel at home when I'm with other believers. My church community means everything to me. It's who I am, it's my life. Very good. So that's before doubt. And then Dan, can you read this other one for us? Sure. Uh, after doubt, um, it, it's a new set of feelings and perspectives. I, I can't be vulnerable and share my authentic self. I've lost a big part of my identity. It feels like a hole. I can sort of relate to the culture, but that's about it. I feel like I'm being judged and misunderstood. No one sees what I see or knows what I know. My vocabulary is different. I need support and I might need a new community. Okay. So uh, we don't need to spend a ton of time here, but Dan, I know that you've been through a faith crisis. Does this resonate with you at all in your experience and before doubt and then after doubt and how your identity was challenged? Absolutely. So what, one of the, the common things, those of us who have been through it, um, we, you, when you go to church, you feel almost like you're just being dishonest. Like, why am I pretending that I 
you know, have this thing in common with these people around me when I, I believe so differently from they do from what they do now or or I just feel so uncertain and they look so certain, right? Um, and, and I know these, you know, aspects of church history or, or scripture that they don't. And, and so I feel different. Um, and, and it's very uncomfortable. You feel like, uh, you know, you, you really don't fit in in, in that community anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, your identity is is multifaceted, right? It's like you and God as a child of God, yes. But the identity is, goes so much deeper. Your, your identity in your family, your identity in your church, your ward, uh, in your neighborhood even. If you're in a highly populated area of the, where the church is very prevalent, you know, your neighbor, you know, what are your neighbors going to think? <laughs> you know, it's just, it's, a, it's tremendously traumatic for, for people. And we, we understand that. Uh, and I personally still to this day go to my ward and deal with some level of identity crisis. I'm not completely there anymore like I used to be, but my past is very different from everyone else. And I, and I have learned how to think about that uh, in a more healthy way where I say, well, so-and-so on the aisle behind me has a different kind of identity crisis. They've had, uh, you know, they lost their job and no one else around here has lost their job. And so they must feel uh, traumatized and may feel like they don't belong in our, in our ward where people are generally doing okay. And they're gonna feel like a burden on the ward as they ask for, for help with food from the Bishop's storehouse. So we all suffer um, and feel like we maybe we don't belong. Um, and in that way, uh, we can start to feel like we do belong. Um, uh, but when we don't believe as other people do, there's a huge gap there on how to navigate that and how to relate to people that are sitting next to you in in worship when, when they believe in a very different way than you. Um, and so we're going to try to address some of that today and how we can try to help people come back to a, some semblance of belief that you were once used to. And that's our goal is to help people get back to a more not fully traditional beliefs or orthodoxy, but to be able to respect and honor what you once believed in and start to believe some of those same things as you once did and maybe a different, little different way. So uh, we're going to talk now just for a few minutes uh, pretty quick about why members of the church lose belief. And there's an amazing study that was done, quietly distributed uh, among church leaders in 2013. That's a faith crisis report. You can see down here is the the link to it. And we're going to send this PowerPoint, make sure everyone has access to this. You can study the, re the research that was done. But this big chart, this is a scary amount of data. It's kind of overwhelming. It hits you right in the face when you see it. <laughs> but there's a lot of stuff here that you can look down through. And this is a the percentage of people who reported in this survey uh, that they cease to believe why they lose belief is because they lost belief in the doctrine or theology. That's number one. Number two is close there. I studied church history and lost belief. Then number three, I lost faith in Joseph Smith. And it goes down through a lot of the different issues that we know about, uh, people losing belief in the church. And at the very bottom, this is what we want to point out, we have a couple interesting ones. Uh, abuse in the church and then offended by someone. So these people are not reporting that they left because they were offended. You know, a very small number of people actually would say that, admit to that, or that they want to sin. Right. This is just basically saying I want to sin. So people are not, at least they're not perceiving their reasons of leaving as as these. And and as members of the church who have not experienced a faith crisis and have, or have left the church personally, and you don't know uh, that this type of rhetoric when we say, oh, the so and so just left and and they just wanted to sin or so and so. Like the example I give is, um, you know. Uh, the bishop in the hallway comes up and steps on my foot and I'm going to not come back to church now because I was offended. And that kind of language, you know, dismissing language that we've used sometimes with some of the stories that we share, you know, to really downplay any kind of legitimacy that someone might have real concerns, sincere concerns, valid concerns, even of why they leave the church and lose belief. We, we need to stop doing that and uh, dismissing these people as uh, silly, silly lost uh, 
you know, Satan filled people that are just offended by on a whim one day in church in the hallway and now they won't come back. You know, <laughs> okay, there's maybe some people that have experienced that kind of silly offense and they don't come back. But those people are easy to recover and they actually would easily forget or forgive uh, and come back usually. But we're talking about people that are very seriously wounded and we need to take that seriously, that, that they're, they're serious about it, we take it seriously. So that's uh, this slide and, and I'll probably just advance unless uh, any other comments there from you, Roseanne, or from Dan. I like nope. that. I think we're good. Okay. So now we're turning uh, the time over mostly to Dan and to you, Roseanne, um, as you walk through these uh, slides on epistemology. Thanks so much, and I'll just follow your lead. Okay. Um, so epistemology is, uh, is a term that we use. Uh, it, it's in the field of philosophy. Philosophers use the term epistemology to talk about the study of, of how we know things, how we decide what we know, um, and how we decide what we believe, not necessarily know, but believe. Um, and in epistemology, uh, people who study epistemology, they, they make a, disting, uh, a distinction between belief, uh, justified belief, and knowledge. So if I believe something uh, and, I, and I don't have a justified belief, it might just be that that thing seems right, even though I don't have any evidence to, to justify my belief. Um, whereas a justified belief is something where you, you've seen some kind of evidence that persuades you, so you feel confident that you could actually defend that belief if, if you needed to. Um, whereas knowledge is more, you know, you have personal experience with something um, that establishes a, a super high degree of confidence in it. So before a faith crisis, usually we have a very simple epistemology. Um, we have these authority figures that we turn to, uh, to kind of tell us what we believe, right? <laughs> so you have your church leaders um, and, and the church educational system. Uh, your your seminary teachers, your ecclesiastical leaders, you know, your bishop, stake president, and, and also, you know, the, the, uh, the general authorities of the church and, and the general officers, right? Though we kind of look to them to tell us what we are supposed to believe. Um, and then we also have beliefs that we arrive at through tradition, through, you know, my family taught me this, um, and, and in my social circles, we believe this. Um, these are all the things that contribute to what we believe. Um, a lot of this contributes to what we call, uh, you know, binary thinking, dichotomous thinking, so, or black and white thinking. It's either this or it's that. Um, and uh, so th that is something that that kind of contributes to faith crisis, unfortunately, because a lot of gospel concepts really do have a, a complicated aspect to them, um, where you know there are some gray areas and and things that are that are not easy to explain. Um, and then we have knowledge versus doubt. Um, we we kind of decide, hey, either I know something or I doubt it. Um, <laughs> And this is, you know, that problem of uh, people getting up in testimony meeting and, and saying, yeah, I know that the church is true. I know that this, I know that that. And if, it, you know, there's sometimes this perception that if you can't say that you know something, that means you're doubting. Um, there, there's nothing in between. Um, again, you know or you don't, or uh, this idea that it, it's all true or none of it's true, right? <laughs> Um, so the, there are, there are problems, uh, so, so let's talk first about the strengths of, of this simple epistemology. Uh, you know, the strength of it is it's enough to enable people to make serious commitments. You know, um, I served a, a mission in Brazil without having any more of a sophisticated epistemology than this, this one on the before side, right? <laughs> um, 
and on that mission, I saw miracles. I, I saw the power of God in my missionary service. Um, I, I didn't need like a really sophisticated way of thinking about what I believed <laughs> in order to make that commitment. That's kind of uh, how I felt about like getting married, actually, you know, like yes. first get married, um, you're going to go to the temple and you're going to make some commitments there. But really, you don't have a ton of prior knowledge of what this is all really means in depth. You're just there and you're kind of drinking it all in as it's coming at you. But you know enough to be able to just say, yes, you can do this or no, you can't. And so in some ways, that's how a lot of new members are when they go through the temple. It's that, okay, I know enough to know, yes, I can do this, even though I don't know what everything means, you know, in depth. Right. Right. So, so this is, um, this model of epistemology, you know, it, it really does sustain a lot of people throughout their lives. A lot of people live and die with a very simple epistemology and they do great in the gospel um so but let's talk about when somebody undergoes a faith crisis um or or even maybe not even a faith crisis but just a, a period of of intense questioning um there there is kind of a a transformation in how we think about things. And, and that is on the after side here. I know it wasn't that long ago, I was talking to a friend of mine and she felt um, a little disconnected from the rest of the group of saints because she said, you know, when I am looking for the spirit, I don't feel it like other people. I can feel it only when I am out in nature or when I am listening to beautiful music or when I'm playing the piano or, you know, things like that. I don't feel it like other people. And I was like, wait a minute, let me tell you about epistemology. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. And so when, when you make the shift to a more mature epistemology, and, and, and uh, I'll say right now, this is sometimes just too painful of a process for some people to do. Some people, it's either, hey, I'm, either I'm going to operate with this sim simple epistemology or I'm out of the church. I'm gone. Right. Um, some people just are not willing to make a transition to, you know, this more mature way of thinking about things. Right. And on, uh, on, on the right hand side here on, on the after side, you have a convergence of circles. And so that's what we call a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. A Venn diagram is a diagram of shapes and, what you're looking for a, with a Venn diagram is where the shapes overlap. Right. And that's how you, you decide that um, different things are overlapping. They, they, they have something in common. So let's say we're talking about um, a gospel concept like um, the resurrection, for example. Um, I could just consult authorities uh, that would be the simple epistemology on the left-hand side. Or I could use a more mature epistemology where I'm looking at, uh, is this a beautiful concept? Is it found in scripture? Right. Um, is there any personal experience or observation that I can lean on to shed light on this concept of the resurrection? Um, and then there's study. What can I study? You know, scholarship and, and other things. Um, have, I, have I had any kind of revelation on it? Is there witness testimony that I can consult? You know, do I know anybody or do I know somebody who knows somebody right. <laughs> who, who is a, you know, a credible, sober-minded person who can say, yeah, I've witnessed this thing. Um, and then you have the experience of other people. And, and so you're looking with a mature epistemology, you're looking for where these things converge. And when they converge uh, and these things all kind of point to what you're, you're thinking about, then you have confidence in that concept. Um, and really, I'm looking at this before and after. One of these takes a lot of effort. 
And yeah. I think that that's something we forget is that as we grow in the gospel, more efforts required to grow. And if you're not willing to do all of these things, then you, you really aren't giving it a fair shake. Yeah. Yeah. It, it takes more effort and it's slower. Right. Um, <laughs> you can't just consult a couple of conference talks yeah. and, and yeah. say, okay, it's solved. You know, um, you might study an issue for years yep. doing the more mature epistemology uh, before you arrive at a sense of confidence about it. You might be just weighing these things and seeing where they converge, where they diverge, um, and why do they diverge, and, and exploring those things. You, I mean, you, you are looking, for, for some gospel concepts, you're looking at years of yep. application of this. Um, so the nice thing about it, though, is when you arrive at confidence using a more robust epistemology like this, mm -hmm. that is rock solid. It's not going anywhere. It's very hard to shake somebody who has arrived at their beliefs through a really mature epistemology. Um, so I, there's a, another a uh, couple of bullets down there just below the diagram. One of those is just kind of some other elements that you might add to your, your epistemic framework and, you know, intuition, authority, reason, inference, and fairness. You know, these are all, um, these are all things that you can include and, and explore as you're trying to figure out what you believe. I love the fact that there's so many different things and we don't need to rely, and we probably should never rely on one solely. That's the idea of the Venn diagram, that things can overlap and that as they do, you have a more clear picture. So that's why I will, when I'm talking to my friends about it, I, I always talk about it as like almost like a GPS system for myself where I've got these, you know, ep ep epistemic satellites. And as each of them give me a position, I can start to see a better picture of where I'm at or where the truth is at really. So yes. I love that. There's so many different things, but if we rely solely on just one of these things, it's not really as helpful as when we have several of these things together converging. So I love this. Right. Right. And, and uh, you know, a, a mature epistemology is going to make those distinctions between what I believe and you know, do I, do I have a justified belief in something and do I know something? Right. And, you know, we're, we're going to feel more comfortable saying there are a few things that I can say that I know. Mm -hmm. um, and there are more things that I can say, I have a justified belief. I, I have some good reasons to believe this or that. And then there, there are still more things that we say, I, I believe this. I, I don't have, you know, I have a belief in it. Uh, not necessarily because I have some compelling evidence, but it just seems right to me. Yeah. Um, and, and we feel comfortable distinguishing between those belief, justified belief, and knowledge. I love that we've pointed that out because there is that growth that needs to happen. And arriving at knowledge, that, that takes effort and probably years, like you said. Right. Okay, Leo, next slide. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to talk about splitting for a minute. <laughs> we're going to splitting logs, everybody. <laughs> you know, I, I've actually done this a few times. I'm not a, <clears throat> I'm not a woodsman. <laughs> I, I do like cabins. I like being outdoors. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you all have liked being outdoors too. And, and, Absolutely. and, uh, but I've actually tried splitting logs before. I don't know if you've ever tried this, but man, it's hard work. <laughs> I have definitely done that all my years in the Boy Scouts of America. They oh. you know, have done everything you can think of. And yeah, that actually, it's one of those things that as women with the upper body strength, it, it takes a considerable amount of extra effort. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I've done it too. Nice, nice. It's fun. It's good exercise. But we're not going to be talking about splitting logs and uplift. I mean, we can if everyone's interested in talking about that. But we're actually going to be talking about a psychological term, splitting. And, and what that means. And it's related to what we mentioned on the previous slide about dichotomous thinking or binary thinking. So we'll, we'll read this. 
and I can read this uh, for us. Splitting is a cognitive distortion and is defined as the failure in a person's thinking to synthesize the dichotomy of both positive and negative qualities into a realistic, cohesive whole as a person navigates through new, confusing, or uncomfortable situations, splitting can be commonly used as a defense mechanism. When splitting, we tend to think of, uh, and express ourselves in extremes. For example, uh, uh, motives, actions, and characteristics are either all bad or all good with no middle ground. Splitting is also known as dichotomous, polarized, binary, black and white, or all or nothing all or nothing, all or nothing thinking. So there's the definition of splitting. And now we're gonna try uh, together, this will be fun, try a, a thought experiment. <clears throat> so we're, we're gonna show you, uh, Dan and Roseanne, I'll show you uh, several pairs of opposites. For example, tall and short, up and down, pass and fail, etc. Can you provide, uh, the question is, a single word that accurately describes the middle ground between each pair of opposites. We'll start with an easy one and answer it together and note that identifying the middle ground will become progressively harder with each new pair. Okay, so, are you, so are you all ready? Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, all right. So let's see what we get here. Again, a reminder, sing, single word. Okay. First one, what do you think? Great. Great. <laughs> nice. I didn't have to even help you. <laughs> awesome. Got it. Probably lukewarm. I would go with lukewarm as well. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think there's a wrong answer, but I think that's probably a good one. Warm. Yeah. Pretty easy. Let's try this one here. Mm, I would say center. I would agree. Center. Center. Yeah. Yeah. I thought of middle, but MS center is good. Yep. Middle middle is probably redundant, not probably a, not a good answer, but I like center. Yeah. It's good. Let's try the next one here. A little bit harder. I would say, Ooh, that's a tough one. I, I want to say windy almost like they, there's some like center in there, but I don't know why. I, I would, think I would say stable or stability. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. You had to dig, dig a little bit more for that though, Dan, right? You're not, you're not, it's not easy. Or not you, obvious. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I know you're, <laughs> you two are smart, Roseanne. You're smart. I know this is probably too easy for you, but <laughs> it, I struggled with this one. That was good. I like stable. I thought of, um, I'm trying to remember the one I thought of. I don't know. It doesn't matter now. We'll keep going. <laughs> All right, let's see what we got here. <sighs> I would say content. I don't know. Maybe if that's a word, the good center, though. What do you think, Dan? Um, gosh, uh, melancholy is not good because that's sad, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Um, uh, balanced. Yeah. Or, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess a more technical term might be like stoical or neutral or something like yeah. that. I don't know. Neutral. neutral is actually a really great. There you go. Not too bad. That's actually pretty easy. Yeah. Neutral yeah. or like just satisfied. Maybe I thought about satisfied. No, that's good. Right. Enough. Yeah. Okay. See what we got here. Next one. Mm. Of course, I'm right back to the word gray, and um, you probably got something better, Dan. Because <laughs> there. Um, between right and wrong. Uh, I would say. I I might say. Ethically ambiguous. <laughs> oh, that's a, yes, yes. That's two words. It's not fair. <laughs> that's ambiguous. true. That that is two. Your just, two words. Just ambiguous. The word, just the word ambiguous. That is right there. I think. Yeah. There you go. You got it. I think that's probably a good one. All right. Let's see. A couple more. I think. 
again, between almost something ambiguous. Hmm. I would use the word benign. Oh, there you go. Wow, good. That's a good one. Good, good. You guys got all the answers. The exercise is to teach us uh, that, that finding middle ground is just not easy sometimes. Like, I don't know um, if... If, uh, if this takes practice, it probably does uh, in our lives. And just to help illustrate that for us to avoid the, the dichotomous thinking, polarized thinking, black and white thinking, sometimes we have to dig a little bit. So that's the point of this exercise. So, yeah, that was good. Good job. So, so Leo, I'm, I might add here that some, some of these things are, they just come from life experience. Um, and I wouldn't expect somebody, I wouldn't expect the me who was just coming out of high school, for example, to understand this. I, w I wouldn't expect 18-year-old Dan to, to understand this. But, you know, there, there are times if, if you've ever managed a team of people at your job, for example, um, there are times when you're faced with a situation where you may have an employee who is doing very damaging things and putting other employees at risk, but also has a family to support. And you're like, okay, if I let this person go, that is harmful to their family. <laughs> but if I keep them, then it's harmful to the rest of the employees here who also have families to support. And, you know, if you've never experienced something like that, then it's oftentimes it's it's really easy to think in very black and white terms about decisions that other people make, um, and, and it certainly yeah. applies to decisions that church leaders make. It, it's very easy to paint things in very simple terms if you've never experienced a situation where you've had to choose between two awful <laughs> choices or two good choices. You know, I was even thinking as far as women are concerned, we're often in the, I can't make this decision because there's too, too many things here and I don't have enough experience. So we, we land in this realm of indecision sometimes when we're faced with those type of situations. We're just absolutely beside ourselves. We don't want to make a decision because we don't want to be wrong. And so when I look at this, finding the neutral, the middle ground, it's often very... Oh, it's just anxiety ridden, at least for the women that I mostly interact with. And I hear this all the time, totally uh, insecure feeling that surrounds it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, embracing that insecurity in times. I mean, of course, we have, we do need to be able to speak uh, in black and white terms at times. We have, I mean, the Book of Mormon, if you think about the Book of Mormon, the way it's written, it's extremely black and white uh, thinking. <laughs> Good, or good and evil all the time, back and forth. Yeah. There's really hardly any neutral. You have Nephi and Laman. I mean, the way that they're portrayed in the Book of Mormon, it's just, it's black, it's extreme opposites, right? Uh, is right. Way, unless you think, and then the recent movies, that, to illustrate this a little further, and that when you read it as a child, when I was reading the Book of Mormon early on in my life, and reading these stories, it was so easy to paint Laman as a, a really bad character. Like, he's just bad, right? Right. And then these these recent movies that have come out, hopefully everyone gets a chance to see these. Oh, they're amazing. Man, you see Layman and Lemuel and you're like, your heart goes out to these guys. Yep. Like, they're, <laughs> they're struggling. They're trying. Uh, and uh, so, so yeah, we've got to learn how to do this a lot better in the church. Uh, and and so if you've, if you've uh, been a victim of people who have been very black and white with you personally, treating you like you're evil, know that there's not, uh, everybody in the church is not like that, and that we have a, a wonderful group of people in Uplift who are are learning how to do this. We're not perfect at it, but we are getting there. So, anyway, back to you, Dan, on epistemology. Okay, so this is another way of visualizing um, epistemology, and this is a a picture of a round table. So, a round table is a is a place where people gather together together to counsel and, and make decisions. Um, so epistemology can be thought of as a round table where we invite different voices. And here we have scholarly authority, we have experience, we have witness testimony, we have intuition, we have inference and logic, 
uh, we have beauty, we have ecclesiastical authority, and we have personal revelation. And again, just like in the previous diagram on epistemology, you can, you can add or subtract voices depending on, on what you're trying to think about. Um, if I were a biologist, um, I would not be applying a spiritual epistemology. <laughs> I would excuse some people from the round table <laughs> and invite other people to the round table if I were doing experiments in biology, for example, um, or if I were, were a physicist. Um, if I were a theologian, um, you know, again, I would assemble a different round table to talk about questions of theology than I would um, if I were buying stocks. That's a, you know, the, the, these are different aspects of life that, that require a different round table uh, for your decision making. So, Leo, do, do we want to go through the strengths of, of each of these or? Okay, here we go. Very good. So, when we talk about epistemology, um, epistemology is found in the scriptures. Uh, and there are a, a couple of examples we'll discuss here. One of these is in Matthew 16. And this is that famous passage where Christ, um, he asks his apostles, he says, you know, who, who does everybody say that I am? And they say, you know, some say you're John the Baptist. Some say that you are Elias, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he says, who do you say that I am? Whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answers, and he, he gives that magnificent witness statement, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. So this is an example where Christ is saying He's making a, a declaration, an, an epistemic declaration to Peter. He's saying, you didn't arrive at this knowledge by consulting the people around. Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto thee. Um, you didn't read this in a book. You didn't um, arrive at it. You didn't crowdsource this knowledge. <laughs> uh, it was revealed by my Father, which is in heaven. So um, this particular question of the identity of Christ does not lend itself to crowdsourcing. That's part of Jesus's message here. He says, you know, this is something that really does need to come from God. Um, Pauline epistemology. This, when we say Pauline, we're talking about uh, the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul had some really, really great ideas about epistemology. And I'll be honest, you know, these ideas are, are upsetting to a lot of people um, because they, they go against uh, a, a lot of assumptions that we have of, about how we arrive at knowledge. He says in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of none effect. So he starts off in verse 17 by saying, you know, Christ didn't send me to teach with wisdom of words. In other words, I, I, I'm not supposed to dazzle you with my logic and my persuasive abilities. <laughs> and he says, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Because if Paul were so dazzling in, in, in his eloquence and stuff, then people would worship Paul and they would ignore what happened on the cross. That's what he's saying, lest the cross of Christ should be made of, none, made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So he's telling the people, um, you know, this teaching that we are offering about the cross, among people who are perishing, it's ridiculous. And he's basically, you know, when he says unto those that perish, he's, he's talking about those who will just will not receive this message, right? And for others, they see it for what it is. It's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. So that's 
Paul quoting Isaiah 29. And he says, where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? So another way of translating that word disputer is debater. Um, because in Greece, there was a, a debate culture. They liked to debate and dispute ideas and, and arrive at knowledge through by way of debate. And he's saying, you know, hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? So all these ways that the world arrives at what they believe, um, you know, through, the, through philosophy and debate and literature, um, God has made these things actually look ridiculous by this ridiculous thing that we call the cross. <laughs> For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. In other words, the world is applying all these tools, philosophy and debate, and they're not knowing God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. Um, but he says unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What Paul is really getting at overall here, and I've kind of uh, interpolated <laughs> as I've gone through these verses and added my own commentary. What he's really getting at is the gospel is going to look ridiculous sometimes. Um, uh, some of these things that we teach, they just, if you look at it on its face, um, this idea that a, you know, somebody suffered for all the sins of humanity, totally ridiculous. And yet it happens to be factually true. It defies logic. It defies the normal you know, uh, methods that we arrive at what we know. It's, it's just a different form of wisdom, a different form of knowledge. Um, and so Paul is, is just saying, you know, this round table that we talk about, if all you have at your round table is logic, the message of the gospel is not going to make sense to you. It's going to be foolishness. Um, if your round table is, if you arrive at everything that you believe by way of like sophisticated debate, um, again, the, the message of Christ is, is going to sound, it's going to come across as ridiculous. But if you are open to spiritual things, then this is going to, it's going to resonate with you as the power of God. So these are, these are big concepts in epistemology in, in the scriptures. Next slide. Okay, epistemology and paradox. Um, paradox is, is a, a very, very important concept, okay? Uh, here we have a, a quote by Joseph Smith, and he says, by proving contraries, truth is made manifest. In other words, he's saying, let's look at opposites. Let's look at things that we think are opposites or that are in contradiction with each other and let's try those, let's prove them, let's explore them, and that's how we will arrive at the truth. It's a great way to arrive at the truth. Um, it's a wonderful epistemic statement by Joseph Smith. Paradox is this situation where you have two things that are trying to be true, <laughs> but, but you think can't be true. Both of these things can't be true, and, and yet they are somehow. Um, so let's go through some examples of, you know, examples of paradox that we, uh, that we might find in, in our daily life. Leo, do you want to read the real world examples? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so this sentence is false. I need to act natural. Less is more, more is less. To bring peace, we must war. Humility is my greatest achievement. I like that one. I think that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Today is opposite day. I'm preparing for the future by focusing only on today. My normal is weird. The only thing I know is that I know nothing. Yes. 
So those are all, those are paradoxical statements. They're, they contain things that can't both be true. <laughs> um, let's talk about some spiritual examples. Roseanne, would you be able to read these ones on the right-hand side? Sure. So some spiritual examples are death brings life, obedience and grace, truth and kindness, justice and mercy, made free as servants, last is first, first is last, lose life and find it, blind seeing and seeing blind, weakness is strength, humility brings exaltation, under his yoke we rest, and suffering reduces suffering. Yes, so these are just outstanding paradoxes in the gospel. Um, you know, th this is a, a year where we've been studying the New Testament, and, um, you know, one of the most striking paradoxical passages in scripture is Jesus washing the feet of the apostles. You read that and you say, that should not happen. This is the king washing the feet of his subjects. <laughs> Kings don't do that, you know. They have their feet washed by their servants. And here he is washing the feet of the apostles. Um, so any thoughts from either of you on some of these spiritual examples of paradox? Well, I know for me, the first thing I always think of with the spiritual paradox is when people say they're thankful for their trials and that how their trials you know, help them to solve their problems in life, even though trials are problems. <laughs> and so, you know, sometimes we sound like we're masochists because some of these things that we say lose our life to find it, you know, um, but when you really take those things apart and, and really look at them in depth, all of a sudden, it makes sense, even though at first it sounds totally absurd. Yeah. And to add to that, Roseanne, I love that. It, suffering reduces suffering. So my Savior, uh, the thought of him suffering for me on the cross and draw, in drawing me toward him through his suffering, uh, it just... I had someone close to me once ask about the absurdity of that and why an all powerful God would suffer, would need, would need to suffer. You know, that's a, that's a paradox. There's no reason, logical reason for that. And as I've thought about that and, and studied um, the, the way that that draws my, my heart to him and allowing himself to go and, and suffer that way for me, uh, it just changes everything. And so, uh, that's my favorite one. I love that. Very good. So that's a good discussion of paradox. And uh, paradox embracing the reality and, and the, um, the, the blessing of paradox is, is a, an important aspect of, of emerging from faith crisis, of, of plowing through faith crisis. It's, it's part of the growth that's necessary to, to come through a faith crisis. Next slide. The power of inference. Okay, <laughs> so inference is, um, we arrive at a justified belief based on evidence. So um, we, we have some examples of inference here. Uh, one of them is imagine approaching your home and the road is wet, why is it wet? Um, what evidence is available to you? What additional evidence should you look for and consider? Based on the evidence you gather, possible inferences might include, you know, you might think it's a recent rainstorm, a broken pipe, children playing with a water hose or a fire truck, etc. So you can infer from the wet road that something happened, and then you think through what is the most likely thing to infer. Uh, if the entire road and the the hill, the you know the the ground on the sides of the road are all soaking wet, it's probably a rainstorm. If there's just part of the road that's wet, um, then it might be a broken pipe or or something else. So you you look at the evidence and you 
you arrive at a conclusion based on something that you see. It might not even be wet at all. It could just be a brand new road being laid. Like sometimes it's opposite of anything you could have conceived too. Right, right. Fantastic. So uh, Leo, would you like to read this example for us? Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> so years ago, my great-great-grandfather, Willard Richards, picked up a copy of the Book of Mormon for the first time. He opened it to the center and read a few pages. He then declared, that book was either written by God or the devil, and I'm going to find out who wrote it. He read it through twice in the next 10 days and then declared, the devil could not have written it. It must be from God. And that's from Todd R. Callister's book, The Blueprint of Christ Church. Excellent. So what does this tell us about inference? I mean, uh, you, you'd, you know, he, he basically, he saw a book in his hands. He saw the title. He maybe read kind of the first couple pages and thought, uh, he, this, this is uh, based on what I can infer at this point. I'm not sure. But after reading it, uh, and seeing the, the way that Christ is spoken of so highly and people worship Christ and just the beautiful uh, message that's there, he realized that, uh, that it couldn't have been the devil that wrote it and that it must have been uh, produced through, through a prophet and by God. Very good. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's look. I'll go. So, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> No, what were you going to say, Roseanne? I was just going to say I like that he had already come to the conclusion that it couldn't have been written by just a man alone. And it had right. to be one or the other um, because everything that was given to him evidence-wise told him that it could not have been written by just a man's imagination. It was too intelligent, too intuitive, far beyond what a regular person could just produce. So he was able to arrive at those two past the man equation, right? Right. I love it. Um, it here, and here's another example of an inference, and this is one that, this is one of my very, very favorites. And this is Eliza R. Snow in one of her poems. She said that the temple testifies that Joseph Smith, the great and good and wise, is God's true prophet. How in the world did she get there from there? <laughs> she, she's saying that the temple testifies that Joseph Smith is God's true prophet, you know, building a building. How does that, how is that evidence of Joseph Smith's calling as a prophet? Well, if you, if things are going on in the temple that we believe are going on, then it's, one of the very most powerful evidences that, that he was a prophet. Um, you know, if people in our day and age, for example, are experiencing miracles in their temple and family history work, if they're experiencing miracles as they're doing temple ordinances, and, and if the power of God is evident in, in all of those things, then that is very, very compelling evidence that Joseph Smith is exactly what he claimed he was. Um, otherwise, it, it would just be a lovely building where people gather together and do things. And, <laughs> uh, you know, y you wouldn't expect to see God honoring sacrifice to do temple work unless it's valid. So that is the inference that Eliza R. Snow made about the relationship between the temple and, and Joseph Smith's calling as a prophet. It's a great inference. Mm -hmm. You know, the more I learn about the ancient elements that are in the temple, the stuff that Joseph and Brigham, uh, et cetera, got right. Uh, and uh, it just, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, and so I start to infer outside of my spiritual experiences, my epistemologies, expanded to include a lot of these ancient evidences that that uh, I just love to study and I, I guess that's my plug for anybody that struggles with the temple to to check with us on some of these great uh, resources that we have that talk about where the temple uh, elements actually came from uh, and to not listen to those who say it's just a uh, uh, he lifted it from somewhere else so yeah yeah and this is uh, honestly, you know, the, this might be a little bit of a digression, but 
I'll just say that the temple has has become such a surprise to a lot of people who have been through faith crisis. A lot of people think, you know, when they go through a faith crisis, I don't know how I'm ever going to love the temple again. And then they end up loving it on the other side of, of faith crisis. They end up loving it more than they ever thought they could. Um, so it's, it's something that, you know, if, if you're in that situation, uh, uh, we we do have good resources and and we would say be patient and and keep an open mind yeah so switching gears now here we're going to talk about uh deconstruction so if you need to take a break everybody uh if you're listening to this we've been going for a while uh pause the video and this is an important section all right so dan you can probably take us through this too i've got uh the three things that we're going to talk about, what is it, what is it not, and how does it happen? So I'll, I'll begin here and uh, let us know how we can help. Okay, so deconstruction is a word that, that we hear often when we talk about uh, people who lose their faith. Oh, my faith was deconstructed. I deconstructed my faith. Um, the, it, it's really an academic term for the pulling apart of a belief system or, or the pulling apart of, of a specific proposition, break it down into its parts, take it apart, okay? Uh, within the context of, of uplift, it's any effort, whether purposeful or not, to tear down the most cherished and sacred beliefs of others. So if left unchecked, a painful, it's, uh, deconstruction is a painful process that can result in the total abandonment of faith and loss of church membership. Um, and a lot of people, honestly, that's where it leads. They, they learn, uh, growing up in the church, they learn how to maintain their beliefs and defend against them. And then, you know, there, there's kind of the, the classic uh, stereotype of the college sophomore who comes home and all of a sudden is picking apart everything that their parents believe because they learned how to do that in college, right? Um, the ability to deconstruct a belief is something that you learn. And, and a lot of times when somebody learns that skill, they don't harness it. They don't use it appropriately. They just deconstruct everything, um, including their faith in the restored gospel. So let's talk about what it is not. And Leo, let's have you read this one. Okay. So a fail-safe process for arriving at, it kind of paused on me. There we go. Arriving at the truth, easily discernible as an attack on faith, e.g. classic anti-Mormon literature, an ideal resting place away from the big questions or negative emotions, Welcome and uplift. It's not, uh, at least not in a boundless form. It's not an act of charity, and it's not a reason to ostracize a loved one who engages in it. So a lot there uh, about what it is not. Uh, happy to talk about any of those items, or maybe Roseanne can, can weigh in here. Let's see. If I was to pick one of those, um, I would... I guess I would probably go with a, um, a attack on faith. For me, um, not it, this happens quite a bit as I like reach out to maybe various people that I know are reading anti-Mormon literature, and it's just really quick an attack on my faith or attack on how I believe things. So. Mm -hmm. that's one I think of immediately <laughs> yeah we have you know traditional attacks on our church it's interesting I was talking with Kara Dawson and our team uh, this week doing another recording and and she talked about mentioned something in, in passing it was interesting that growing up in the church she was around the god makers right that was the type of uh, attack that she was facing very obvious attacks I mean it's like yeah <laughs> This, watch this video, you'll leave the church, you know, like someone has to give you the VHS and you have to put it in your machine and, and turn it on and, and, yeah. and, and, and in a quiet room uh, where, where no one else will watch. And 
uh, you know what? Uh, today, she said that today we're, there's uh, basically deconstructions happening all around us, even within the walls of the church. We have attacks on faith and on the belief systems that make our church what it is. And so it can be very subtle and it's not always easily discernible as an attack. It, it, um, people speak from their experience. They say, this is my experience. This is the conclusions that I've arrived at. This is my authentic self, that kind of language that is used in the church today. And uh, it really at the heart of that, we have a, a, it's a, and it's not meant purposeful to be mean or to hurt people. They're not, this type of language that people use in the church today is not meant to destroy faith, but it, it does destroy faith. Uh, people do end up leaving the church who engage in this kind of uh, mentality uh, where the truth claims don't matter. Uh, you know, it's just a social club. It's the horizontal versus vertical faith that we talk about often in Uplift. So anyway, I'll pause. So, and I would add, um, when we talk about an act of charity, okay, is it kind to deconstruct someone's cherished beliefs? <laughs> um, some detractors from the church think that, yeah, I'm, I'm being nice by tearing down people's faith in Christ or, or faith in whatever, you know, and, and it is not kindness. It's, it's not um, I, I happen to love being in sacred places of other faiths. I like to go to other churches. I like to go to Catholic churches, Protestant churches. I love being in other people's sacred spaces and just honoring their devotion there. Um, and, you know, I, I had a recent, uh, I had a recent trip for work where I was passing uh, I was driving down the freeway and there was a, a Catholic shrine. Um, and I said, you know what, this is a nice place to stop. I'm going to go and, and visit this Catholic shrine. And I did. And, you know, there were a lot of devout Catholics there um, and just worshiping at this Catholic shrine that honored one of their saints. And it's just a beautiful place to be, beautiful people, you know, uh, performing their devotional acts, right, as, as a faith community. Would it have been kind for me to go up to them and say, you know, maybe this saint had some problems that you're not aware of. Maybe this person actually really did some things that you wouldn't like. Or maybe, you know, these spiritual experiences that people claim around um, saints, maybe they're not real. You know, I, I, it would have been a, a terrible thing for me to do, to, to do anything like that. And it and, almost, it almost sounds like an act of charity. Cause you're like, Oh, I'm gonna, I could inform these people and I could, right. you know, I could help them. I could save them. But is it really? You know? Yeah, it, exactly. And, and that's, it, it is absolutely not a charitable thing. It's not a kind thing to deconstruct someone else's faith. Um, even if you disagree with that faith, right, right. you know, um, you know, it, if there's a good, sincere worshiper at a Catholic shrine, I am just going to honor that person's experience and love them. That's it. You don't, you don't go around trying to poke holes in, in other people's faith. It's not a nice thing to do. It's not, it's not kind. Um, it's not respectful. It, so it, it doesn't even invite growth. Honestly, a lot of people think, Oh, I'm going to save them, but they don't realize that in no way would that ever change their mind. Right. Um, only building on commonalities tends to do that, you know? Right. And, and let's imagine that I had a group of Catholic friends and they invited me to, uh, to come to their Sunday school or, or join an online group of Catholics. Um, if I were to do that, I would have to weigh in my mind, you know, hey, if they're going to be talking about um, Christianity, uh, you know, it, if I'm not able to respect their views there and avoid deconstructing their views, I might need to just decline to participate. Yeah. Um, I might need to just make that decision. Hey, you know, I, I don't think I would be able to hold back from challenging things that these people believe. 
So I'm not going to participate in that group. It, it wouldn't be a good place for me. Um, there's nothing wrong with making that kind of a decision. We make those decisions all the time. Um, and it, it's, it's not dishonest to make that kind of a decision. It's, it's charity. It's charitable to say, hey, let's, I'm going to let these people, you know, believe what they want to believe in their group and teach what they want to in their group. And I'm, I'm just going to honor that. And even the opposite is true. If you have someone who is Catholic who has come to your worship service, you wouldn't say, ah, you're in my space now. Now I can, you know, go after you and attack your faith. It's still wrong. Right. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the other thing I'm going to add, just to add on top of this, is that uh, because I have talked with uh, some of the people who in the church who are struggling with their faith and feel like, they need to have a, a sacred place uh, for them as part of the, you know, considering themselves part of Mormonism and wanting to come in and, and be part of the community and share their, their views and their authentic selves. And when I've talked about this comparison of, you know, would you go into a, a mosque, for example, and, and deconstruct someone's faith in Muhammad? And of course they would say no to that question. That's an obvious one. They're all going to be respectful uh, and not attack uh, a stranger, but when it's people in your own church community that you've grown up with, somehow it, it, there's a difference in they compartmentalize uh, for some reason between a different, you know, someone that's a stranger in a new faith community. Oh, I'm going to honor them, and that's easy probably for almost everybody to do. Most people are are sensible enough, yeah, uh, sensitive enough to be able to to not attack in that situation, but there's some kind of like green light that, that some people feel uh, like they have a, a, a reason, a good reason and, and a green light to go into their former faith community or community that they feel is being ostrac is ostracizing them where they do need to belong. And they're trying to make space uh, for deconstructive messaging in the sacred places that we have because, because it's a different situation. It's not the same thing. And so I was going to propose that question to you both. If you have a good, answer it is it is a different situation but is it a valid argument to say because this is my community that i've grown up with i have a right to 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 make space for my lack of belief here in this sacred place who decides in that situation i i would i'm going to let dan answer this one because i think it's incredibly complicated and you can never go into a community demanding anything. I mean, I don't even let my children do that in my family. So, all right, Dan, what do you think? Well, uh, so I, I've learned some hard lessons in this by experience. Um, I, you know, having been through a faith crisis and having read, you know, who knows how much literature about biblical studies, for example, that was my big issue. Um, when I go to church, I, I define a lot of terms differently from the people around me. Um, I, I still believe wholeheartedly in the core doctrines of the church, in plates and angels and the Book of Mormon and all of these things. I believe that Nephi was a real person and, and all of that. But, you know, my, my views on how revelation happens are, are probably a little more nuanced than you know, uh, so, some of the people I go to church with. And, and there, are, there are people I go to church with who, who say some things that I know to be wrong about uh, world history, for example, and, and the transmission of the Bible over the ages and, and stuff like that. And, and I always have a decision to make. It, it, would it be charitable? And could I do it in a loving and charitable way that benefits this person, you know, to help them understand what is really true about, uh, you know, ancient biblical texts, for example, if, if they have a, a naive view of, of those kinds of things. And I, I weigh that and I say, okay, if, if, if it would not benefit this person and they, and it would not contribute to the spirit of the discussion here at church, then I'm not going to do it. Going around bursting people's bu bubbles, it might make you feel smart. It might make you feel like you're right and other people are wrong, but it's not charitable. It's not kind. 
and it, it's it's not a good thing to do. Um, I so I I do bite my tongue <laughs> quite a lot at church, and I'm okay with that. I just think that is part of if I want to be part of this community, I need to respect that and actually, you know, think of things in that way. Okay, yeah. I love that you said respect because that's kind of what the core of it always will have to be because when you're in a situation where you don't really know if you belong anymore, there's that, you know, you're surrounded in insecurity. And when you're surrounded in insecurity, you have a lot of these false ideas that you either need to force your opinion or you need to bottle up and be timid and quiet. You forget that you're able to slough off that insecurity and just try for true connection in respect. Yes. That's, there you go. <laughs> so, so I, I think it is important to honor um, the, the purpose of, of the community and, and the purpose of the gathering. You know, Sunday school mm -hmm. is an environment with a, with a very specific devotional purpose. Whereas if I had, you know, some church members over to my house separately and we have a discussion about um, the transmission of biblical texts, <laughs> I can actually, you know, I, then I could talk with, talk about some scholarship that, um, and, and have more of an academic discussion with them rather than a devotional discussion. So, um, but, but even then, you know, I would pay attention to, you know, is this, this person's first time hearing, for example, that we don't, uh, have the original manuscripts of, <laughs> right. of the Bible books. If so, then baby steps. Let's talk about what somebody is capable of receiving right now, because that's the kind thing to do. It's not kind to just, you know, nuclear bomb somebody's whole worldview because you think they, they need that. Absolutely. Leo, were you okay. going to say something? Uh, what well, was that? We're able to finish up this uh, last section here. It's basically what we've been, we've been talking about. We're hamming this topic away because it's so important. So thanks for everyone's patience. <laughs> yes. So yeah. um, how does deconstruction happen? Uh, it's a natural process as we're exposed to new and challenging information. Sometimes we, we find out details of history that um, don't, you know, they don't conform to what we, the, the picture that we developed in our mind or, or that our seminary teacher told us. Um, we examine the evidence and, and any other variables, biological or environmental, that support or refute the belief. Uh, we, we challenge deeply rooted cognitive, behavioral, and cultural patterns. Um, we allow new worldviews to emerge, finding little to no reason to believe as we once did. So somebody who deconstructs their entire faith, they do a, a combination of these things. Um, and, you know, uh, sometimes it, it just, it destroys everything. They're, they're not able to believe anything anymore. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so we can move on here. We're going to try something fun to further illustrate deconstruction. All right. <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> uh oh. What is that? A spaceship? Oh no, that's the <laughs> Earth. <laughs> I love that. This is a cool. Uh, I found this artist on Blender, and, and this is a cool illustration of what the flat Earth might look like. So. There we what, go. Know what, what it does look like, right? Uh, dear, 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 up here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so here we go. <clears throat> We're going to have a little interaction. Who wants to be the interviewer? And who wants to be the flat earther? Uh, I will definitely not be the flat earther. How about that? I'll be the flat earther. <laughs> okay. I'll be the flat earther. <laughs> okay. All right. This is fun, uh, and we and for anybody that is flat earther out there, we not. I don't know. We want to be respectful to everybody, but anyway, okay, we're going to, we're not going to laugh too much about this. We'll, we'll just try to learn from this and be respectful. Okay. So interviewer, go ahead. All right. The last thing I want to do is say anything that's going to insult you because I can imagine you have people who are trying to prove you wrong. 
I'm up for discussing everything. Have you always believed this since you were younger? No. Was there any point where you believed the earth was round? And how did it all begin? Yes. Well, first of all, I won't be offended by anything you say. You know, I'm all about questioning. Everything should be questioned. Nothing should be off the table. For me, it began about two and a half years ago. Up until two and a half years ago, I was just a normal person. I had dreams of getting a big house, a big car, the normal things we all do. And then one day, I don't know if you want to call it a mental breakdown or if it was a midlife crisis, but I just started questioning life. Like, why are we here? What is the meaning of all this? The world is just so messed up. Like, what's going on, you know? And nothing really made sense. And I found myself questioning myself and everything else. So one day, I was on the internet, YouTube, just browsing, looking for anything, just to bide a bit of time, if you like. And I was already quite interested in conspiracy theories. So like ancient aliens and that sort of thing. Yeah, I've never looked into that. I was watching some ancient alien conspiracy theory video, you know, and then I saw at the bottom of video, flat earth, man claims earth is flat. I thought, what? This is ridiculous. This is the most stupid thing I've ever seen. The earth is not flat, but just for a laugh, I'm going to click on it and see what this crazy guy thinks. You know, like we all do, we scoff. So I clicked on it and I was eating and I was just having a laugh. And all of a sudden, about 15 minutes in, I stopped laughing. I put my plate down. I started listening and thinking, this guy is making sense. A lot of what he's saying is actually making sense. I've never thought about that before. <laughs> so that's it. There we go. That's the... Uh, oh. The initial, uh, the start of a, a long conversation, you can look at this video uh, it's on YouTube and watch these two talk, but really interesting. Any parallels that you can see there with deconstruction of faith? I, I, I can see a few. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> the, so one, one of the things that we, uh, one of the, the, the ways that faith is deconstructed is people receive information that they don't have answers for. And they think that because I, I can't answer this, I don't have a good response to this. The person who is articulating this attack on my faith must be right. Because if they were wrong, then I would have a good answer for it. Right? Well, that's an assumption that we make. <laughs> the reality is it is very, very possible to make rational sounding arguments. I mean, even like well-documented, well-supported arguments against things that are true. So here you have a flat earther, and I would bet that on that video that this person watched, um, that persuaded this person, you know, started this person down the road of believing in a flat earth, I would bet that that person actually said some things that are true and said, oh yeah, if the earth is round, how do you explain this? You know, and probably said some things that are true. And the person said, wait a minute, I don't have an, an explanation for that phenomenon. I, uh, and then after that happens a few times, it's like, whoa, what else don't I know? Uh, you know, where, how, how deep is this rabbit hole? And, and then their view, their belief in a round earth gets deconstructed. You know, one of the things I noticed right away when he said, all of a sudden, about 15 minutes in, um, if you sit long enough, <laughs> you know, like you just said, after especially a long time of what I would call sandbagging, where you're just getting hit, fact, pretend, you know, let's pretend fact after pretend fact, uh, questions that are sounding very you know, provocative. You sit through about 15 minutes of that, you know, and you're not able to re reply or to, you're not looking up uh, the, those facts or things yourself. You, man, in 15 minutes, that's a long time actually to sit and to not have that affect you.
Mm -hmm. And we have some cases, uh, if you go on Reddit, for example, uh, you can read cases of people, and there's other places you can find this, but people who have lost, uh, you know, 30, 40 years, even uh, 50 sometimes, even later, longer years in the, in the church, uh, after a weekend of reading, uh, we have another slide about this, but the CS letter, you know, uh, and, that, and not, trying to, not trying to say that all people that leave the church leave after a weekend, but after a weekend of watching videos, of reading a CS letter or letter to my wife, there are people who deconstruct everything, you know, 30, 40 years of experiences, of, of positive, beautiful experiences in the church, of testimony, uh, after just a few days of study. And that does happen. People have explained that as being the reason why they left. And, uh, and they often, you know, I've noticed a lot of people will not give credit to Runnels and the CS letter. Uh, they won't do that because they want to, uh, they want to place blame on the institution. And so, and I'm not saying this to accuse them or to attack these people, but they often talk about the church, the, the, the official sources. Uh, I read the gospel topics essays and I lost my faith in a weekend or whatever it is, or I've been, you know, but it is, it can be happening very rapidly. People can go from full belief to no belief in a matter of a few hours. And it's just, I, when I read this, or I saw this interaction, I thought, oh my goodness, this kind of thing is a natural phenomenon. People experience it, even going from a round earth to a flat earth. And it's just an incredible example of, to me of, of being a reality this can happen to anybody do you guys think that in some ways this exploits people's pride in themselves to know when they you know almost like i have enough if i, I was this person i might say i feel very confident that i cannot be swayed but it almost is a false sense of pride that there doesn't exist a person out there in this world who has an amazing persuasive skill that is superior to what you have to combat that. And I think a lot of people go into these things very naively, like, I am a very rational person, and there could never exist somebody so persuasive that they could, you know, get past my defenses. I think sometimes that is a, a false idea that we have, that we are that powerful. And pers there are persuasive arguments out there that are absolutely well put together, much better than even the CS letter or the a letter to my wife. And um, if we're not able to see that there, there are persuasive, skilled people out there, um, then we're not really in the, in a place of true like knowledge of where we're of who we are and what we can withstand. So I, I feel like a lot of people think, oh, it's not a big deal to to go out there and to search these things, but you do really open yourself up if you're not prepared, you know, if you don't understand that you don't have the skills often. I mean, right now, even I know that there are certain things I wouldn't go search for um, just because I, I might not have the skills yet to understand that, you know, I don't know. I just thought throw that out there. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, so that's right. And, and, and Roseanne, I would add, you know, I, I, again, you know, my, my crisis was over questions around biblical studies. There are, there are a lot of very, very well-structured, well-considered, well-researched theories that Bible scholars hold that, that contradict things that we believe in the restored gospel. Um, and I, I was not prepared for what I was reading. <laughs> and it just destroyed me. Um, I mean, really just made me question, like, how do I go on? Um, and how do I trust the church if they're not aware of this and that? And, and um, it took years of study to understand how that whole system of scholarship even works. And now it's, it's hard to phase me because I, I, I just, I understand how that system works. I, I appreciate it. I respect it. I, I actually, I read, I still read a lot of that material, but now I know how it works. And so it, it doesn't bother me. I, I can have my faith in the restored gospel 
and also appreciate this other system for what it is. But a lot of these things, um, they count on you not investing yeah. a few years to really yeah. learn, you know, historiography or, or yeah. ancient languages and, and, you know, scholarship right. yeah. and stuff. Yeah. They, they, they count on you just falling apart in a weekend and, and that's what happens. Absolutely. So without patience and without years of study and that, that effort, you know, we, anybody can be deceived in a number of things just by saying, I'm an expert in, you know, worms. Let me tell you all about worms. And you know nothing about worms. I mean, I could tell you just about anything. Right. <laughs> Compelling arguments. <laughs> anyway, let's go on. Yeah. So we can talk now a little bit more about deconstruction and, and try to illustrate it in a different way to help to show what we mean here. Uh, so it really comes down to a question. Are we, tear, are we tearing down or are we building up uh, is really a very simple question to ask yourself and when it comes to sacred or cherished beliefs of other people. Mm -hmm. So we'll look to see what we do, what we mean here. Uh, <clears throat> so we have on the left deconstructive messaging, what we call it, or DM, and then constructive messaging, CM on the right. Uh, and we will go through these. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy to have someone else read. Um, I'll read the first one if you want to read the second one, Dan. Um, the first one just says, deconstructive messaging, your beliefs are damaging. So the constructive counterpart to that is saying, I'm hoping to learn about the value of your beliefs. Absolutely. Okay, how about here are the issues with your beliefs? Okay, the constructive counterpart is saying, it seems we have many beliefs in common. I used to believe like you, but I was wrong. I'd be happy to share what I believe. Another deconstructive message is, I am not interested in honoring your belief systems or your beliefs. Right, versus I want to honor your beliefs. I'll tear down your bridge to make you use mine. Or let's use your bridge. Okay. And I like that it's not, um, by saying let's use your bridge, it's not necessarily saying let's just totally agree with your belief system. It's saying, well, let's, let's use your idea here because I'm not threatened by it anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, it's not total agreement. We're not talking about that. We're talking about how do you see the, the world? How do you see your, your beliefs? Um, let's talk, let's start with, with you know, being willing to do that. And, and if you extend that grace to someone in a conversation and understand where they're coming from, they often are willing to try your bridge out too. You know, <laughs> if you start by offering yourself and being vulnerable and willing to to listen and to learn from the other person, they often are, most often are willing to learn, listen and learn from you. Wouldn't you both say that context matters as well? Because sometimes there are appropriate times to have a deconstructive message, mm -hmm. um, but context matters so much. And when somebody is presenting something to you um, and you don't agree, there is a positive constructive way to handle that for the most part. Um, I, I mean, Go, I mean, we, we talked about this before, how sometimes deconstructive messages are necessary, but we want to steer away from them mm -hmm. as much as we can. Yeah, context matters for sure. Exactly. That's exactly right. What do you think, uh, Dan? <laughs> I, I agree. Um, this is, uh, you know, one of the things that a couple of people have said within Uplift is, if you bear your testimony, then you're deconstructing my belief, which is that the church is not true. You know, the church isn't what it claims to be. Well, right. you can't, you can't do that. Um, <laughs> you know, again, like I, I don't go into a Catholic Sunday school and tell them not to deconstruct my beliefs in the Latter-day Saint faith. <laughs> I, I don't right. do that. Um, <laughs> I can't, call them deconstructive if I'm in their space where they are 
teaching their beliefs. I, in their space, I, I it, it's the burden is upon me to, I, I shouldn't say burden, the privilege <laughs> that I have yeah, yeah. is to respect their beliefs and not tear those down. And, and if I can't do that, I need to not be in their space. So I, uh, anyway. I, I just have to say really quickly, I think also text versus in person is very different mm -hmm. and we have to be very careful. I think of Mosiah um, 12, I think is where he was saying, you have not applied your hearts to understanding, but really sometimes you can be a little more like that when you're in person because you can say it without guile or you can say it in a, in a way that a person, it resonates to them. So you might say, in text, that sounds deconstructive, but then in person, within tone, inflection, body language, may be very appropriate and no longer be deconstructive. So I just want to throw that in there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so we have this image uh, to talk about it, to tie it in a little bit, but it's kind of a cool picture. You can see it's a half-built bridge, it looks like, uh, where they started and they got here and they up. Oh, uh, we got to stop for whatever reason. It looks like it's pretty old. It's kind of interesting. Um, and, you know, or you could say, well, maybe they actually had a full bridge that it was built and someone actually tore it down and, and left this part remaining with all the birds and everything on it. That's kind of a, a nice way to think about it. So are we going to try to build this bridge with somebody and like on your over here on this side and you try to meet them in the middle? Or are you going to tear down their bridge completely or leave it half built? Um, you know, there's a lot of questions to ask yourself. Are you trying to build bridges or not? Um, and if you are, if you have that mentality of I'm trying to build a bridge, I'm being patient with how you see things, then it's going to be a lot better experience for you, especially in a sacred place like church. So uh, a few questions. How can I avoid unnecessary deconstruction? How can I develop a pattern of constructive messaging? And how can I become a better bridge builder? So that's our, our goal. We're gonna to try to answer these questions in the next couple slides. Uh, the answer really to sum it up is this, is uplifting with love. And here's a nice little community of believers here you can see, right? And, and they're all on the same page, or at least trying to be on the same page, all uplifting each other with love. And you could have a per person come into this space. Imagine if you were a stranger and you came and sat down, you know, how would you interact in that moment? When you, when you sat down, would you raise your hand and start asking difficult rhetorical questions, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to disrupt this peaceful moment? I wouldn't. I surely, I surely would not. I would sit and listen and learn and try to feel the spirit that's here uh, and be willing to share if I'm called upon, you know, and I would do it meekly. Uh, that, that would be my ideal uh, way to do it. Of course, I'm not perfect and I may need to raise my hand and, and, and blurt out something if it, if it was just not right or whatever, but I would try not to do that. That's my default position is to listen and learn as I were to approach this sacred place with these, with these, good men. Um, so, so now we're going to talk about details about how we uplift with love. Uh, what These are five areas of self-reflection. Uh, and again, to ask ourselves, if we were to enter that community, this, this is just a small, a microcosm example uh, of what it might be like to, uh, for a small community to enter, what would you do here? So you first ask yourself, uh, motivation. Do you want to read this for us, Roseanne? Sure. So motivation. What's our motivation? Is love my primary motive or am I trying to use authenticity to push boundaries? Do I carry resentment, anger, or other negative feelings? Am I mainly seeking silence or agreement when I interact? Like that. Yeah. So what are you, what are you motivated by? More complex creatures. We have a lot of different motives within us if we're honest with ourselves. Um, really, are we, if you're driven by love, that would break down a lot of these other issues. If your primary motive is love, and then we can work through some of the minor uh, sec or secondary or tertiary motives that we all deal with. Right. Um, so in that authenticity, right? 
Dan, are you your authentic self when you walked into that Catholic cathedral and, and didn't say anything? Were you being authentic? <laughs> I love that question. Yes, I was being authentic. <laughs> really? I don't know. You're not your authentic Latter-day Saint self. Because my uh, the authentic self that I want to have ah. is somebody who is respectful of other people's beliefs and traditions mm. and not hostile toward them. <laughs> so I was being authentic. Now, okay. you know, um, I... I have been invited to participate with some online groups where they talk about gospel issues in ways that uh, I, I would disagree strongly with uh, the people in those groups. Um, I would, I would be engaging in debate all the time and, and stuff like that. And, and I think me being my authentic self, you know, if you're talking about, issues that I feel super strongly about and you're actually wanting my authentic opinion about them and it would be disruptive to your group for me to voice that, I just won't participate in the group because, you know, me being authentic, uh, I, I can't be the kind person that I want to be. I can't be respectful if you're, if you're, you know, you, you, you kind of have judgment calls to make sometimes when, when it comes to authenticity. There there's, there are certain groups that I just won't participate in, even if I have friends in those groups, because I, I don't know how I can maintain <laughs> kindness and, and respect when, you know, some of those things are being said that they, that they say in those groups. Mm -hmm. And that leads us to the next one. Um, I can read this one. Are my interaction, interactions gentle? Am I open to learning more? Or do I constantly consider my position to be superior? Am I open to feedback and to adjusting how I interact? This one is important for me. Um, part of the reason why I love Uplift and why I love all the people that are with us um, is that I need to be challenging my position uh, constantly. And that allows me to be uh, to do that and to have people question uh, why I'm doing things, what I, why I say what I do, um, but to do it in, me, in, in gentle ways, of course. But I'm open to learning, and, and that's part of the reason why I want to be an uplift is to, to learn how to be meek uh, and why I go to church as well, of course. But uplift is really important for this, to teach me how to be meek uh, and to adjust based on the feedback of, that I receive. Uh, and I'm not perfect at it, but it's a good attitude to seek to be, to be meek with, with others. Mm -hmm. Um, the next one here, uh, Dan, do you want to read this one? Yes. Real human connection. Did I recently meet you? Do I see you as an enemy or as a friend? Do I see you as a beloved child of God? Am I worthy of your trust? Do I treat you as I want to be treated? Do I pass the next door neighbor test? Um, this is an important one to think about because online interactions uh, are they often just don't lend themselves to, to these kinds of questions, right? Online, people are often meaner <laughs> because they're not sitting yeah. right across from, from a, a human being who they, they can see. Um, and so we really do need to talk about, okay, am I, am I treating this person as an idea rather than a human being? And wanting to, you know, take a sledgehammer to this idea that I hate. Um, and so I say mean things, you know, rather than saying, hey, you're a human being. Um, I, 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 you, you may have arrived at your beliefs honestly. Um, I can disagree, but I can also respect you as a, as a human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, that, that uh, imagining knocking on your neighbor's door. And the person that you've been arguing with for the last two hours <laughs> on the internet, that imagine their face coming to the door. Oh my goodness. What, what kind of shame would you feel? Right. I mean, I mean, it's just like, you, I mean, it's so hard to, to, to avoid this, but we, we have members of the church that uh, I've, I've, I've been one of these myself. And so I'm speaking from a place of experience that I used to spend time, 
as an aggressive apologist for the church. I, I did that. I lived that life trying to fight my way back into faith. And I thought I needed to tell everybody how stupid they were for fighting against the church. And man, I, I had to get that out of my system, I guess. But I went through that and not treating people as if they were my next door neighbor. I, I, was, uh, I sinned uh, and I have since repented. And that's why I love Uplift is because we are, we are going to treat each other as if you are, you are my best friend in the whole world. And I love you, sincerely love you. And I can look you in the eyes and not feel like I need to hide because I've, I've been yelling at you for the past, you know, two hours or days or whatever it is. So really important um, to bring that real life interaction that we know and we love to, to have onto the internet. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. All right. Okay, go ahead uh, with this one. Okay, sacred moments. Is this place, is, wait, is this place time sacred to you? Are these sacred activities? Can you tell me about the sacred elements of your community? Am I willing to put my own needs on hold and show you respect? That's a really, that's a really wonderful one. I have many times been to other people's um, churches and you do your you do need to put your own needs on hold and show people respect while you're there um, I think we've already talked a lot about this but as we interact with people we shouldn't dismiss them in their sacred moments or their sacred beliefs and of course that goes into cherished beliefs if Dan do you want to read that one yeah um... Can you tell me more about your cherished, or can you, can you teach me more about your cherished beliefs? How, why, and when did those beliefs become cherished? Will I show respect by using constructive messaging while I participate in your community? So I, again, you know, I'll use the personal example of going to a, a sacred place for Catholics. I do that all the time. I, I just, I, I've always kind of had a crush on Catholicism <laughs> and, um, I love how they treat certain spaces as sacred. I love visiting those places and, and just being around devout people. Um, but I would never, ever open my mouth to say, um, even, I, I wouldn't even open my mouth to say, what you're doing here is beautiful, even though I don't believe in it. I wouldn't even do, don't even say that. You know, just let people have their sacred space and enjoy it and respect that um we that is part of being you know just a respectful human being and yeah. and um you know not feeling like you need to go around bursting people's bubbles or just telling people that yeah i see things differently well what if they just don't even need to know that <laughs> why not just let them enjoy their sacred space you know, part of being authentic and being genuine and real is also being emotionally appropriate and being a responsible human. That is an authentic thing that we should strive for because when we interact with others, is it about us and what we get out of it? Or are we really there interacting with them so that we can, um, you know, have this connection and, and listen to them? And, you know, I mean, it's, to me, it's so much about that other person than it is about us. And if the circumstance, you know, is right and that person is open and they ask you for more information or ask you about your beliefs, now it's different. But until that really happens, you, you're there with them and you're there where they're at in their journey. You know, you're there with them, not, you know, there's no other, I want to say, like, thing that is stopping you from, I guess, being with, be, basically just giving them everything about you, um, almost like emotionally vomiting on them. You know, you're there to honor them when you're with another person. Thank you. And this, this slide really is like the money slide for Uplift. Uh, this is, I just can't emphasize this enough. We talk about the uplift vibe, uh, and this is it. I mean, if, if you can study anything from this presentation, if you're watching this, please uh, 
read these questions to yourself. Uh, wherever you go, this is a, a principle uh, that would apply uh, at work even, <laughs> you know? I mean, anything you do, uh, meekness is a, is a powerful principle to follow. One of the things that I've been thinking a lot about recently is the term privilege. And, you know, as a majority first class member of this church, as a, as a first class believer, um, I, I'm, I know I'm not second class. I know I have privilege as someone who affirms the truth claims of the church. I know that I am first class as far as being married in the church, in the temple, uh, having a ceiling and having, having children. I, my heart goes out to those. Uh, our, our hearts do go out to those who feel marginalized in the church. And so our messaging here is not meant to, to put you in your place. If you're listening to this and you consider yourself a middle way or whatever, you know, if you're marginalized in church, you feel like you don't have a place here. That is not the point of what we're saying. Uh, our point is not to make you feel like you don't belong. Uh, you do belong. We want you here, but we want you to be respectful. And even though we're the majority and we have privilege, we still need to ask for some semblance of, of, of dignity, of be able to worship in peace in our sacred places. I, we need sacred moments just like you. And so come in and, and, and visit with us in ways that are appropriate. Uh, talk about your belief in, 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 in ethics, if that's all you have at this point, in your, in your, in your high moral standards. If you don't believe in God, don't believe in Christ, okay, come in and talk about service and the, and the good things that you experience in life. Uh, and don't deconstruct my faith about Joseph Smith, please, about priesthood keys, about President Nelson being a good man. That is not appropriate. And I would never tell you that you do not have morals and values because you've left the church. I will respect what you hold to be cherished and your, your family values and your personal values. I, I honor those things. They're beautiful. And so this is a two-way street. This is a bridge. And for anyone who's feeling like I'm the, an uplift that we're telling you, you can't be yourself, you can't come in and participate. No, that's false. It's a, it's a lie. And I don't know where you're getting it from, but you are welcome to be with us, but to, to be, uh, respectful to our cherished beliefs. And that's what we're, we're asking for. And we have rules set in place in the church, standards. So, you know, not really written down, it's expected. You don't come in and stand up in sacrament meeting and share your truth over the pulpit and deconstruct everyone's sacred beliefs. I've seen that happen and it's, it's abysmal. Uh, it's embarrassing. I, I just can't talk about how how terrible that is that people are doing that. And, and this is coming from someone who's been through it. I understand the pain of cognitive dissonance of faith crisis. And a lot of us in Uplift have been there. So this is my plea to you to meet us in the middle and to not demand your space in our cherished uh, and sacred places. It's just not appropriate. So, so Leo, I, and, and I, I would give an example. Let's suppose there were a, a group on Facebook of Latter-day Saints who want to talk about the book of Genesis in the Bible, okay? And they call their group um, Exploring the Meanings of Genesis for Latter-day Saints, right? <laughs> um, but the group, part of their mission is to promote a young earth theory, that the earth is 6,000 years old. They don't believe in evolution and stuff like that. If I were to go into that group, um, you know, I, I might be interested in exploring the meanings of the historical narratives in, in the book of Genesis or, you know, the poetic elements of the text and, and some of that stuff that they might talk about. But I would have to make a decision if, if, if this group, if they want to believe that the earth is 6,000 years old and I can't avoid challenging that belief, I might need to just not be a part of that group. Or I can join the group and just say, hey, when those discussions come up, I'll kind of step away, <laughs> let people <laughs> talk, about, talk about the age of the earth however they want to, live and let live. Um, but just out of respect for that group's, 
priorities and their their mission and, and their beliefs, yeah, I, I would have to make some of those decisions. And and I wouldn't feel oppressed or like they're denying me my right to talk or anything like that. It really is just a matter of can I respect these people's mm -hmm. desire to believe something? Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. All right, we've hammered out, de de we've deconstructed deconstruction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's the right use of the term. I'm confused. I don't even know what deconstruction means anymore. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, uh, we want to move on to the, the final slide here, I think, is what we've got. So when we talk about our, our faith, uh, one of the ways that we talk about faith and uplift is balanced faith. And um, sometimes we hear the terms vertical and horizontal faith. Uh, so... Horizontal faith is, is faith that is uh, grounded and focused uh, horizontally or towards the people around us and um, horizontal sources of information, you know, asking other people for answers, asking other people for insights on gospel topics and, and things like that. Um, Vertical faith is, is different. Vertical faith is faith that is oriented toward God. So when we talk about horizontal faith, um, let's, let's talk about some of the things that somebody with a horizontal faith orientation would say. The thoughts and opinions of others matter to me. I depend on my community for a greater sense of love, fellowship, and purpose. My values are formed by listening to other people. Certain leaders heavily influence my feelings. I compare aspects of my community with the outside, and I'm impacted by this comparison. Uh, vertical faith is, is very different. Um, vertical faith, somebody with a, a strong vertical faith orientation, orientation towards God, they're going to say different things. My relationship with God is the most important one. I depend on God for a greater sense of love, fellowship, and purpose. My values are formed by listening to God. I appreciate all leaders who point me to Jesus Christ. I place tremendous value on those aspects of my community that align me with Christ and his gospel. So a, a person with a strong horizontal faith orientation, they are going to struggle when their community disappoints them. So. Uh, if somebody uh, has a very strong horizontal faith orientation and they go to church and they see behavior of church leaders and members uh, that disturbs them, it's they are not going to want to come to church anymore. Um, they, their, uh, their basic, you know, since their orientation is horizontal, they are very, very severely impacted by things that other people do and say. Um, whereas somebody with a vertical faith orientation, they are not as rattled when people around them say and do certain things. Um, if they hear a, a, an insensitive comment in a church, they're not going to fall apart over it. They're they're gonna their their understanding is more rooted in their their own personal relationship with God, so they can respond to things like that uh, a lot better. However, you know somebody with a strong vertical faith orientation, they can struggle over having a, a period of their life where you know they feel like God isn't answering their prayers or they might read things in the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, where people <laughs> attribute some pretty terrible things to God. Um, or, you know, they might be rattled by the problem of evil. Why is there so much suffering in the world uh, among innocent people? Um, these are things, if you have a very strong vertical faith orientation, these things can rattle you. So what we're trying to promote and uplift is a is a balanced model of faith where you know you you keep these things in balance you uh we we don't want people to come to uplift and just say ah here's a community to replace 
my other community that, you know, where I, I feel disillusioned, you know, my, my community at church or the people around me in my neighborhood who are members of my faith. We don't want to do that. We want to help actually point you to Christ. Um, and, you know, part of that paradoxically is, you know, anybody who has a strong relationship with Christ, who, who you meet, they're going to say the same thing, that Christ points us to the people around us. So, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so somebody with, with a good balanced faith, they are going to have a relationship with God that allows them to handle the difficulties from interpersonal issues at church or, you know, gripes that they may have with church leaders. Uh, if a church leader disappoints you, if you have a strong relationship with God, you can say, Lord, help me to see this individual the way you see this individual. And God will do that. God will help you to, to understand how God feels about, you know, a particular church leader or church member. If you don't have that relationship with God, then you are basically just at the mercy of your expectations for other people. If they meet your expectations, you're, you'll, you'll be okay. If they disappoint you, you know, you might fall apart over that. So once again, you know, in Uplift, we're trying to promote and encourage and help develop a, a balanced faith in, in the members of our group. So uh, the model of gospel questioning that we promote in Uplift is methodical, it's slow, um, it's not like perhaps what, what you might have been taught growing up in the church. <laughs> um, we, when somebody comes with a question, we, we want to follow a process. We want, to, we want to help you arrive at the very best possible answer. And that means being aware of what you're bringing to your questioning and being aware of, you know, the strengths and weaknesses of different kinds of resources and what a, what's the right epistemology to apply to the question and, and stuff like that. But first and foremost, if you, if you come to Uplift with a question, we want you to think about this first, okay? Let's say I have a question and it's about church history. This is going to look like going on a tangent, but it's not, okay? Um, I, would, I would want you to ask a couple of questions. Do I have an experiential testimony of Jesus Christ? And do I have a growing relationship with Jesus Christ? Okay? Um, because if you can answer those questions, both of those questions, yes, then you have a you have some resources available to you in your questioning um, that you don't have if you can't answer those questions, yes. Let's say your answer is no, I, I don't have an experiential testimony of Jesus Christ. I've, I've always heard about Jesus growing up, but never really experienced the atonement. I've never experienced this peace that people talk about um, from, you know, experiencing the atonement of Jesus Christ. And I don't really feel like I have a relationship with him. Well, if, if the answer to those questions is no, we ask you to keep an open mind and practice prayer and fasting. Um, I, I wish that more people understood the value of fasting personally. I, I started, when I was in my faith crisis, I fasted every week for a long time. And it was just wonderful. It, learning the discipline of fasting can really help you become in tune with some really powerful spiritual concepts. Um, serve people in need. If you want to know, uh, if you want to know God, you you need to be in God's presence, and God is with people who are in need. So if you are around people who are in need, you are you will feel God's presence with you. Um, embrace brokenness. Don't think that you're a person who has to have it all together. 
if you don't have a really strong testimony of Jesus Christ and you just hope for one, but other people around you seem to have, you know, these really solid convictions about him, um, be okay with that. Be okay with, with being exactly where you are and not having it all together. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't, I, I tell people, I don't, I don't ever want to be anything but broken. Um, it's a great way to, to perceive ourselves is that we're all broken. We all need the savior. Um, the goal is not to get it all together in this life. That's just never going to happen. Um, the other thing, practice mindfulness. Mindfulness is an entirely uh, separate discipline, and, and it's tremendously valuable. Um, the core of, the, of it is just awareness, awareness of our thoughts and our feelings and being able to, to see those things for what they are. Um, if you're not familiar with what, what mindfulness is, I, I recommend researching that. Another thing is listen to witnesses. If you, if you know people who can, can speak like a witness in a courtroom and say, I've seen something, I've experienced something, um, listen to them and think about what they tell you. There, there are parts of the gospel that I do not have a personal testimony of. Um, and I trust witnesses in, in those things. There, there are people around me who do have personal experience with certain parts of the gospel, and I trust them as witnesses. They, if they were in a courtroom, I would say that is a reliable witness. Um, another thing is study grace. Uh, that is, if you want a testimony of Christ, I think studying grace is, is a foundational element of, of that process. Spend a lot of time studying what grace is and, and how it works and practice grace so that you, you have some experiential knowledge of it. Um, sacred art and music. There are a lot of people who, when they hear gospel concepts taught to them verbally or, you know, read them in the scriptures, it doesn't quite get through. But when they when they experience it in the form of poetry and music and art, then it clicks. Then their minds and hearts are, are capable of receiving it. You might be that kind of a person. So engage with sacred art and music. And another thing, co connect with believers. Uh, spend time with people who are believers and, and listen to their stories and, and the reasons why they believe. So, if you're answering yes to these questions about testimony of Jesus Christ and your relationship with Jesus Christ, then categorize your question. Is it a question about history? <clears throat> is it a, a question about scripture? Is it about theology? Theology is basically the study of God. <laughs> How does God operate? What, is, you know, what are God's attributes and... and um, so that's theology. And then is it a question of doctrine or is it a question of policy? And to, once you categorize those, uh, once you categorize your question, you can determine the right epistemic framework, okay? So if you're trying to figure out a church policy, for example, you, you're going to use a different set of epistemic resources. Remember that image of the round table your round table is going to look a little bit different than if you're asking a very fundamental question about theology, like why does evil happen in the world, for example? Um, or a question about scripture, like, you know, why does uh, the gospel of John say this, and, the, and that's not included in the gospel of Luke, okay? If you have a, a question about scriptural texts like that. Um, you're, you're going to need to figure out what is the right epistemic framework to apply to your question. Um, and for some of these, like history, scripture, and theology, you need to figure out who has the right professional expertise to apply to the question. Do you need to consult a historian? Do you need to consult a scriptorian, somebody who, um, who speaks the ancient languages of Hebrew or Greek, for example, who can actually get into 
uh, the history behind the passage you're, you're questioning and, and talk about the meanings of, of the, the text. Um, do you need to consult the work of a theologian, somebody who has, has studied your, your theological question? So another thing, um, once you've done that and determined, you know, the right professional expertise, gain an awareness of your source's intellectual and spiritual commitments, which means their worldview and their school of thought, okay? So when you are looking for scripture scholars, for example, um, are you reading a scholar who has decided that there's no such thing as God? or that God is irrelevant uh, in discussions of scripture. If you're reading one of those scholars, you're going to get a different set of possible answers than if you read a believing scholar, somebody who really does believe in God. Um, they are going to ask different questions and they're going to get different answers. Um, so, you know, the kinds of resources that you are engaging with those determine, uh, you know, the, the possible out, outcomes of, of what they're going to be able to give you. Dan, um, are, are you trying to say that every person on this planet, including um, these really incredible scholars, they all have a bias? You mean there's nobody who's actually not biased? Let's do just they absolutely do have a bias. I think that one is so... Like, nobody gets that. Everybody's like, no, this person is very, they are not biased. I'm like, what does that even mean? Is there such a person on that, on the planet? Right, right. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I, that's, that's something that we see from time to time is, oh, I'm just looking for unbiased sources. Right. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Where, where is, does that exist? <laughs> right. Unbiased sources do not exist. I'm a biased source. You are a biased source. Everybody's a biased source. And that's okay. Just, you know, as long as people are upfront about their biases and, uh, and honest about them, great. I, I read sources um, about, you know, biblical studies, for example. I read some books by people who believe in God and some books by people who don't. Right. Um, I'm aware of their biases. And so I can make adjustments mentally as far as my expectations and and, you know, it allows you to say, okay, I'm going to take this with a grain of salt. Here's an evangelical scholar. Right. I, I, I see he's trying to defend an evangelical point of view here. I'm going to take it with a grain of salt, you know. Yeah. But, and, and you can appreciate the value of other things that they say. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you, you don't need to, again, I, I, I just say, Anytime somebody says, oh, go for unbiased sources. I know. Oh. Get, get that out of your vocabulary. If that, someone that even not... says that, that they are an unbiased source, I'm like, red flag, red right. flag. <laughs> right, right. Oh, I'm just interested in the historical yes. facts. Yes, ah. no. <laughs> no, you're not. Nope. So, yeah, I uh, bias is everywhere, and it's okay. Don't, right. don't. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't avoid it. It's just a reality. Just need to be aware of it. <clears throat> yes. <laughs> um, and uh, once, you know, once you understand the different various scholarly approaches to things, uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. You know, there are, in biblical studies, when, when people are researching and, and writing on the Bible, there are schools of thought um, for, for even different books of the Bible. There are people who have different approaches uh, to the text and, and different things that they believe about it. And sometimes those things depend on, you know, does that person operate out of Harvard University versus somewhere else, right? <laughs> um, it can be by university. It can be, there, there are different geographic regions of the world where scholars have kind of coalesced around sets of views about the Bible uh, versus other uh, parts of the world where they believe different things about those same passages of the Bible. So just be aware that there are different approaches um, with questions of history. 
uh, it's very important to know what the historian brings to their craft. Um, because, you know, if somebody has an, an ideological ax to grind, um, in terms of, you know, they want, let's say somebody is, let's say that their bias is Marxist. Well, they're going to interpret historical narratives in terms of the oppressed versus the oppressors and, and the, the proletariat, and they're gonna use kind of their, they're gonna impose their framework on it. That's okay, yeah. nothing wrong with that, just as long as you understand that that's that scholar's approach. Um, you're aware of it. Yeah, as long as, as you're aware of it, and, and I would just say be wary of scholars who say they don't have that, that they're only, yes. you know, I'm just giving you the facts. The, stop you know brief, yeah. be be very upfront about <laughs> biases um so one of the things that uh that that we also say is read informed charitable commentary on things so um on questions of doctrine and policy for example let's say if you are uh let's say somebody comes forward with a question about um, the word of wisdom and why is why has our perception of the word of wisdom changed over time or about the priesthood ban you know um, read charitable commentary uh, read commentary by people who just assume the best about the people who they're studying um, any given person and you know in, in the case of the priesthood ban and, and President Kimball um, President Kimball, you know, he, somebody could point to a letter that he wrote to his son where he talked about how he didn't think that, you know, protest and things like that were the right way to, um, to address this, this question of, of the priesthood ban. And somebody could point to that and say, oh, he was just, you know, he, he was just a company man just trying to defend the institution and didn't want to hear alternative voices or whatever, and they could make an uncharitable argument about it. Right. Whereas, you know, somebody looking at that same time period of President Kimball's life could see the man going to the temple every single week with a notebook of articles about the priesthood and, and wrestling with God week after week in the temple alone. And you just see this, remarkably beautiful soul who's struggling and just trying to do what's right. Um, if you, if you look at people with the eye of charity, then it opens up a whole lot of different possibilities. And that includes, you know, looking at church history. Some of the, um, Stephen Harper gave a great presentation about looking at, um, William McClellan charitably. He was, a very fierce detractor from the church in the time of Joseph Smith. How do you look at him with charity? Um, that is the very best thing you can do. Look at charitable commentary, people who assume the best about other people. Um, and then also consult with informed believers and consider the testimony of witnesses. In the case of history, scripture, and theology, Talk with people who have studied these issues and really know what they're talking about. Don't settle for Twitter sound bites on these issues. Um, and consider the testimony of witnesses. Is, is there somebody who actually has witness experience with, with the, the subject that you're talking about? <clears throat> um, so, for example, I read the biography of Eliza R. Snow recently. Mm -hmm. She was a very, very close witness to the life of the prophet Joseph Smith. And I take her testimony about him very seriously. She was there. Um, I, I take it more seriously than somebody who is just dealing with abstractions about him and formulating, you know, whatever narrative from, from other things. Uh, Eliza was a very, very credible intelligent, competent witness of the life of Joseph Smith. Um, 
and on doctrine and policy, seek blessings and counsel from leaders and trusted friends. Um, if you have a, if you're struggling with, with a doctrine or a policy, talk with people who are, uh, who are, you know, knowledgeable and um, even seek a blessing if you need to and talk with, with good, knowledgeable, informed leaders and interested friends. So, but while you're doing that, <laughs> um, all the while you're doing this, look at how we have another arrow going down from the yes <laughs> box. Engage in fervent prayer, fast often. You might need to fast more than once a month, like I always say. Balance study and service. Stay involved in church. Um, engage in devotional practices. One of the best things I ever did was joining my ward choir. Oh my gosh. I, I highly recommend doing things like that. Um, and connect with believers. These things will open up your mind and heart to new possibilities. Um, so do those while you're doing all of this stuff on the left. You know, this might take, for, for any given question, you might spend years um, thinking through this question and doing this and applying this process. It's not something that you'll, you know, if, if somebody gives you an easy answer to a really complex question, then they're not doing you a favor. Um, so anyway, this is a much more slow and methodical uh, approach to gospel questioning than, than you might have had some exposure to before. That's great. Love it. So we are reaching the end. If we could field questions, I think we'd, we'd like to do that. But as we post the video, and there's a lot of content here, uh, just a reminder that we love everybody who's listening and pleased to share this with people. Um, how much did uh, we all make from doing this, you guys? Um, <laughs> blessings from heaven. That's <laughs> what we made. <laughs> we have spent so much time doing this and we don't want any praise for this. We're not asking for that. We're asking for your love in return and for you to praise God uh, and to think about your savior more and to come unto him and to listen uh, with open ears and an open mind and an open heart. Um, we, we, we do not uh, take any kind of donations in uplift. Uh, we have no motivation for, uh, self-aggrandizement. I, I, I know the people that, I, that were, are working with me here. Uh, we are the faces and the voices of Uplift, uh, but we, we, we don't necessarily want that. We want to be uh, decreasing while Christ increases. We want him to be at the, the top of our list at all times. And for you to come unto Christ and to love him and to, to cherish your relationship with him. Uh, we do not, again, intend to supplant the church uh, or any, any uh, other denomination. Uh, we are here as a support group. Uh, and, and so just a reminder about that, it, it, that we, our motivation is, is pretty darn pure. I mean, we're not perfect at what we do. We sometimes make mistakes, and, and I'm sure that this video, if anybody picks up on it, would be a great topic for ridicule. We've probably said some things who have hurt people, and we, we don't mean to do that. We mean to love you and to provide information that's been helpful to us and to others. Uh, and so thanks for being here, both of you, Dan and Roseanne, with me today. Um, I love you both. You're my family. We love you too, Leo. Love you too, man. And you know, mm -hmm. one last thing before we go, I, I do want to remind everybody that um, if you're really struggling and you just want to talk to somebody, that's part of what we do here at Uplift. We, we would love for you to reach out to us and say, I'd like to talk to two admins. I'd like to talk to somebody who, about this certain subject. And we would love to be able to, you know, just chat with you because this isn't about us. We just... We're absolutely blessed when we're able to listen to other people and um, be able to help you through some of the things that we've already faced. And so if you allow us that blessing, we would love to be able to help you um, as you have nowhere else to turn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, it helps us too. We, we appreciate people interacting with us and it's, we all uplift each other for sure. So that's, that's it for this presentation. Um, any final thoughts from Dan, from you or from Roseanne? Not for me. Nothing more to add, Leah. All right, we'll, we'll take a break. Thanks everybody.